I've been married for 11 years and have two children, ages 8 and 5. My marriage has been wonderful until now, something I treasure greatly. My wife was an incredible spouse and a wonderful mother to our children. However, something happened two days ago that caused me to reconsider my ideal, happy family. This Friday night, we were lying in bed trying to sleep. Wife was watching some humorous videos on her phone when the Facebook message popped up, tingling with the chat, and remained for around five seconds. I noticed her name and profile photo on the chat head before she swiped them away. It was 1 a.m. in the night. I asked her who had sent the text. She said, I don't know. Maybe something random from Facebook. I handed her the phone back and asked if she wanted to respond. She answered, no, it must not be urgent. We continue to watch the video. A few minutes later, another method appeared from the same chat, and she swiped it away again. This happened a few more times, and each time our uneasiness increased, followed by periods of stillness. I could detect a frigid, frightening atmosphere between us. I could tell she wanted the phone back, but couldn't ask because it would lead to a new set of inquiries for me. We were no longer enjoying the amusing video. We were only pretending to watch it. My mind was clouded with the question of who was messaging her so late. Why had she become so awkward about it, and why was she pretending that she didn't know when we both obviously saw the name on the pop head? I'm sure she was also frustrated as she waited for her phone to be returned for the fifth or sixth time. I returned the phone to her and added, You should see if anyone needs help. She tried to reassure me that everything was all right, but I stifled my worries and replied, Perhaps someone is in an emergency and requires something, so she should attend to it. I handed her the phone and rolled the opposite side of the back. I could see the reflection of her screen light on the ceiling. A few minutes later, she put down the phone and hugged me from behind. She attempted to snuggle and initiate intimacy, but I did not reciprocate. I felt like candy handed to an upset child. She recognized I was suspicious of those odd late-night communications, so she tried to cover it up with lovemaking. The next morning, I was still down about the entire situation. She asked, what's wrong? I told her nothing, but she insisted, so I questioned who had messaged her so late at night. She claimed she hadn't seen it yet. My face was bare and bald. I'm damn sure she saw those messages shortly after I returned her phone. In fact, I'm very sure she responded to those texts as well. She regained control of the phone for the time being. I'm just frustrated by the way she's lying in my face. I said then, check it now. She raised her eyebrows, implying that I was interfering with her business. I am not nosy. I am bothered because she lied. She then grabbed up her phone and pretended to open and read the messenger. Then she stated it was a co-worker from my previous job. I worked five years ago. I asked her what the message was about. She said nothing, just generalities. I asked, what general stuff? She responded, nothing important. I quickly said, show me. She froze. She was like, what? What do you want to see on my phone? Do you have any suspicions here? I said, I'm not suspicious, but I'm probably curious because of how she's been acting on this text. I'd never been so wary of her actions. However, God knows why this time. I simply don't feel right about it. She has been gaslighting the matter since then. I'm not sure what's wrong about asking her to reveal the phone. I specified that it would just view the chat and nothing else. If she refuses to show me, she accuses me of invading her privacy. I do not know, guys. If requesting to see your wife's phone is an invasion of privacy, or if I'm an a-hole, I'd welcome any fresh opinion. To add, I read the first four or five comments and wanted to explain a few points. I am asked if we have access to each other's phones. The answer is that she has my password and sometimes uses it to make international calls. I do not know her password. Even when I needed to use her phone, she would unlock and hand it over. I never asked for her password. Never felt compelled to know it. This time. Also, I'm not requesting her password. All I am saying is, show me the chat. That is it. Second, this is the first time I've requested her to show me her phone. I've never done this before. As I already stated, I had never been wary of her. If I left out any important information, I would include it in the comments and responses. It's understandable that you are suspicious, Opie. I mean, late-night messages from a colleague from five years ago. That is enough to raise an eyebrow or two. And the whole evading the question process is not contributing any points to the trust meter. Update 1. The last week has been challenging, with numerous conflicts and yelling at home. My home occurred to be a quiet location. 
The only yelling came from my children's battles. However, it has now become a struggle for me and my wife. We fought all week and were both pretty stubborn. She assured me that there was nothing wrong with occasionally checking in on each other. Send birthday and holiday pleasantries, nothing more. I asked, if that's the case, why isn't she showing me that? I want to see that for myself. She stated that it was not about showing the message. It was about trust issues, and I didn't trust her, so I intruded on her privacy. She assumed I would move on from this and forget about it. She tried everything to distract me from this subject. The next day, she organized a gaming night, which didn't go well because I was feeling down. For much of the time. I attempted to be cheerful with the kids while simultaneously making it apparent to my wife that this was not going to help. Then, two days later, she announced at the dinner table that we were going on a three-day camping vacation to relax. I saw through her ruse and informed her that I was too busy to go on such short notice. This month, the children will take their exams. They were also perplexed as to why she was planned a trip just before their exams. Unfortunately, none of her tricks worked. She eventually agreed to display the charts, but she set the ground conditions that I would not take anything else and asked no questions. I said I wouldn't check anything else, but I can't promise not to ask anything. She said, well, let me give you a heads up. Don't be alarmed if you hear some flirting conversation every now and again. Now I'm getting wild. She told me that it was completely innocuous and meant nothing. It was simply some generous compliments on her photos. I replied, yes, I do not. An innocent flirt. I'm not going to ruin my head or my marriage over something so stupid. I read the chats, and there was an on and off discourse, but I found it inconsistent, and there was no chat before last year's Thanksgiving. I inquired as to the status of earlier conversations, as she had known him for six or seven years. He was a co-worker from work. She claimed she deleted it. She claimed to erase or chat every several months. I questioned the rationale behind it. She said, Nothing. Just like this. I wanted to check more chats to see if she had also erased them, but she reminded me that I had promised not to check anything else. So I had to follow the rules. The problem has gotten worse than before. It has resulted in more confusion and dread than clarity. I looked up here for a hack to recover deleted texts, but couldn't locate any. I'm not sure if there is any way out. Do you know of any hacks for retrieving deleted Facebook messages? But I appreciate the help. It appears that you stumbled onto the digital equivalent of Pandora's box, a treasure mine of erased messages and playful banter neatly stashed away in the virtual universe. Who knew? A simple gaming night and a surprise camping trip might escalate into a full-fledged inquiry. Something tells me the juicy stuff was erased, and the camping trip appears to be a distraction. Update 2. Some follow-up on what happened subsequently. As you mentioned, there were no options to retrieve deleted messages via Messenger. It does not go into the archive, so no luck there. My wife suggested that I move on from the experience, but I had a nagging feeling that something was wrong. She suggested we go on vacation. I repeatedly said, let's go to couples therapy. She was repulsive and said we didn't need any. I stated I needed one since what I'm going through is abnormal. My trust is running low and we cannot have a good relationship without it. She consented to see the couple's counselor, visit one. She is overly protective about her sentiments. Before responding, she carefully considers her words. She's more like, I don't see any problems in our marriage. It's only you but I am here to assist you. The therapist clarified that it is about both of us, even if I was the one who requested a counselor. The reason is her. So she needs to be involved and cooperative. Wife stated that she needed time to open up. We return from a session, and I see she is absent-minded. Nowadays, any confrontation with her leads to a battle. She laughs it off and claims that my irrational suspicions are wrecking our wonderful marriage. Yesterday, she went food shopping in her car and got flat tires. She asked me to pick her up while driving back. She was embracing my arms. I asked if she wanted to pop by for coffee. She nodded yes. She remained silent for the majority of the drive to the cafe. She was expecting a confrontation. I also decided this was the greatest moment to discuss it. I inquired if she wanted to confess anything. Now is the time, she remarked. They flirted with one another. Flirting was acceptable with me as long as it was within boundaries. She stayed mute, saying that on a few occasions the bounds may have been violated. She added that limits were crossed, such as with sexting. 
I inquired how many times. I explained that I haven't had the count on and off in the last five or six years. My heart was beating as she revealed a fresh angle to each inquiry I asked. I began asking her the following question. All of my deadliest nightmares were coming true. I wasn't sure if I was ready for the response. That might lead to my next inquiry. With trepidation, I questioned her. Is that all? Was there a physical relationship involved? She took a few seconds to respond, and the pause felt like an eternity to me. She began sobbing and replied, Yes. In that moment, I lost my mind. Like, what the hell? She's been sleeping with a co-worker at my back, and I have no idea. I freaked out. I rose up and exited the cafe. She followed me out. I was racing up and down beside my car. She claimed that was a long time ago, and she had almost forgotten what had happened. The typical line of every cheater, that means nothing. I love you, and my family is everything to me. I answered, no. Family isn't everything to you. If it was, you would not have messed it up. I got in the car before I could drive away. She hopped in. I dropped her off at home. She insisted on having the debate in our bedroom. But I was done conversing with her. I walked to the pub and sat there till midnight, wondering what I did wrong to deserve this betrayal. I have not been home for two days. She has been calling me incessantly to talk, but I have hung up on her. I'm not sure what I'll do next, completely clueless. I could not believe this was physical cheating. To an extreme, I imagined it was emotional cheating. But now what should I do? This is intense flirting, sexting, and physical cheating. It's as if she's accumulating cheating bingo points. Update. Three additional updates on my predicament. Three days following that confession, I received a call from the therapist. She asked if I was going to accompany my wife to the session. I said no, I'm done, and I'm not in the mood to fix this relationship. She stated that her wife was present and waiting for me so she could admit her guilt. I said let her go. To hell with her guilt, hang up. That that day I headed home. She inquired why I didn't attend the counseling session. Don't I want to work on my marriage? I declined and relocated my essentials to the guest bedroom. She insisted that we seek therapy and work through this. We have two tiny children to care for and we should make an effort. I sent her away and didn't speak to her for over a week. Meanwhile, I realized that my house was becoming cooler. My children were silent, which was uncommon given their temperament and age. They quickly observed that I was sleeping in the guest bedroom and not speaking with mom. They questioned me about it and I supplied some backstory. But the problem was mine. I was stalling it. I was delaying a choice. I realized we couldn't live like this. It's either I heal and forgive her, or I separate and move out. Hanging in the middle was the worst for the kids. I decided to go to marital therapy before making my next move, visit two. It was an intense experience for both of us. I assure you, everything that has happened up to this point has not been right. I came to know the whole truth, and thankfully so. I attended the session. It helped me make a decision. Wife admitted that she slept with a decent partner about five years ago. She was experiencing emotional upheaval. She had lost her mother while dealing with postpartum trauma with the birth of her second kid. Her second pregnancy and delivery were painful, and losing her mother shortly after exacerbated the situation. Though I recall having her back and doing everything I could to help her at the time, she stated she needed a place to vent her emotions. She could not think of anything better than cheating. It happened this way. He complimented her on her second child. Then she told him about her mother's death, and he offered emotional support. She confided in him about her postpartum struggles before engaging in sexting. Then I went on a week-long excursion, and they slept. It was the first time both of them felt guilty. They also stopped communicating with one another. They do not communicate for more than a year. Then he sent a message on Thanksgiving and things heated up again. They fell asleep again and ceased chatting after that. This happened six times in five years when they flirted, had sex, slept, and ghosted. So this Facebook notice marked the beginning of the following cycle, and they would have gone to bed quickly if I hadn't seen the notification that night. She cried but said nothing. Unlike the last time, my emotions took over my fury, and I cried like a defenseless child. It seemed like a flood of emotions coming out in the form of tears. She begged me to forgive her and promised that she would never talk to another partner or cheat on me again. 
I didn't say anything, but I had scheduled another meeting with the therapist, and this time I would go alone. Now that I know it isn't a one-time occurrence, I'm quite sure what I want to do. We are still in our late thirties with a few more decades to go. I do not want to be with someone I cannot blindly trust. So, yep, I'm going to file for separation soon. Soon? Why not today? So what are you waiting for? Meanwhile, your children are probably wondering whether they stumbled onto the set of days of our dysfunctional lives rather than their typical after-school special update. We're in the middle of a separation. It's a difficult moment for the family, particularly the children. But we must do this for the sake of our children. We've been living apart since that day. She's offered me a variety of possibilities as a trade-off for divorce, the most severe of which is the freedom to sleep with anyone I want, and she wouldn't grill me about it. I can have a mistress or an affair for a year before promising her that I will return to her and divorce her. It felt nasty. That's not my notion of marriage. I stated that I prioritize loyalty above all else. I was faithful in my marriage, and why should I be prepared to undertake what she is offering? I stated separation is unavoidable. However, if she truly wants to repent or do something for me, she should let me go without being greedy. We would co-parent our children. I've offered her the opportunity to live in our home with the kids, so there will be minimal disruption to their lives. I've seen a place for myself, a small one for my single self, but it will take a month to get possession. Until then, I'm using the guest bedroom as my den. We have spoken with the children about the separation and enrolled them in therapy. We are seeking family and individual counseling to help us cope with the changing dynamics. It hurts to be separated from my children, but I believe it's best for all of us. They've seen us fight and yell at each other, which isn't a pleasant sight either. Seeing their parents living apart is heartbreaking for them. However, they will soon realize that seeing us as happy people is beneficial to everyone. We will keep this thread updated as the situation develops. Update 5 It wasn't as simple as I thought. The day I moved out was a complete disaster for me and my family, including Citibank's wife. I expected this to be difficult, but because I was living with them, I had no idea how difficult it would be. There was too much crying, and emotions erupted. My soon-to-be ex-wife tried until the very end to talk me out of the separation. However, it was not on the radar. I packed up and took my children to my new place. This was to make them understand that they had two houses, and Dad is still here for them, even though living apart. When I was leaving, she hugged me and cried. I'm still mad at her, but I let her cry on my shoulder. She says she also wanted to come to my new house. I said she's not welcome there. She broke down so badly that she didn't care that the children were around and said, I bargained my happy and stable marriage for something so cheap and meaningless. What I did has no importance in my life, and yet I lost everything for that. I said I understand the pain and helplessness she's going through, but she's the one responsible for this. No one. Not even if our partner has any accomplice in her misery. After knowing about their affair pattern, it doesn't look like they had any sort of emotional connection. Sounds like an occasional cold sex, and they move on in their individual lives. Sadly, for wife... I was able to get to the truth that she has to go through this while a fair partner is leading his life peacefully with his wife and children. Not sure if soon-to-be ex has updated her partner about her divorce. It might completely cut off for each other after this. If a fair partner treasures his marriage and doesn't want to end up having a fate like soon-to-be ex. Or they may go deeper into the affair. Their business don't want to break my head over this. Some of you commented that I should inform of her partner's wife about the secret affair. Like me. She also must be in the dark about this. Yeah, that makes sense. But I'm yet to dig into that thought. I have a very limited coordinates about a fair partner, and trying to find the channel to contact his wife would be a task. So maybe once I'm settled into this new place, I'll try to reach out to her. We'll try updating this thread whenever possible. But even if I don't or delay it, I want you all to know that I appreciate all the support I got here. What a roller coaster ride you've been on, AP. The Divorce Olympics, where the hurdles are high and the finish line keeps moving. Separation is never easy, especially with kids involved. But it sounds like you're handling it with resilience. Your approach to the situation, despite its challenges, is refreshing. It's commendable that you're prioritizing your children's well-being while navigating through this difficult time. Co-parenting can be tough. 
but it seems like you're committed to making the transition as smooth as possible for them. Here is the next story. Lisa sat at the kitchen table having just finished reviewing her upcoming speech. She had gone through it repeatedly, searching for any significant flaw, but found none in her three-page notes. She not only outlined all her arguments, but also anticipated every counter-argument and had responses ready. Ultimately, she concluded that with the speech she couldn't lose. Perhaps she might not win, but she certainly couldn't lose. Briefly, she pondered what she had to lose, which brought a smile to her face. However, she realized it was too much to risk satisfied with her wording. She shifted her focus to timing. If she presented it to Dave slowly, it might resonate with his logical mind leading to his agreement. However, that would also give him time to formulate counter-arguments. Having known him for eight years, she acknowledged that in a battle of logic, he would likely prevail. Thus, the slow approach was out. Her preferred strategy remained shock and awe. Hit him hard, hit him fast, and secure his agreement before he could gather his thoughts. Was his agreement critical? Damn right. Without it, nothing would progress. That was the risk-free aspect. Nervously, Lisa stood up and busied herself in the kitchen, trying to distract herself from the inevitable pain she was about to cause her husband. He didn't deserve it, but she felt compelled to do it to get what she deserved. She justified her actions by reminding herself that he had backed into a corner, leaving her no choice. Therefore, it was his fault. Lisa scanned the kitchen, trying to recall the last time she had been there alone on a weekday. It must have been at least six months ago. Before that, she was always the first to arrive home and welcome the kids back from school. What caused the change? It was simple, John. John was transferred from another office seven months ago to become her boss. Initially, they maintained a typical boss-employee dynamic for a month. However, things shifted when he asked her to stay late one day and then treated her to dinner as a gesture of gratitude. They discovered they had many shared interests, despite him being eight years younger and single. Their mutual appreciation for the arts, movies, and fashion deepened their connection. Gradually, the compliments on her work and appearance increased, leaving her flattered but also concerned about aging. Their after-hours interactions became regular, progressing from work discussions to casual conversations over coffee or at the office within a month, they abandoned all pretense of work and spent evenings together. Within another month, his expressions of loneliness and dislike for dining alone led her to skip family dinners to accompany him to restaurants more frequently. By the third month, their outings extended to movies and shows as well. It also encompassed numerous weekends when she toured out of town or local attractions to justify her absence at home. She claimed there was a potential promotion on the horizon, and she aimed to distinguish herself by putting in extra hours. Though she felt a twinge of guilt for this deception, her husband Dave wholeheartedly backed her newfound ambition, despite knowing it wasn't right for a married woman to act this way. After 17 years of selflessly being a mother, she felt entitled to a few hours for herself each day when she was with John. She felt valued in a different way, while her husband constantly expressed appreciation. It had become routine over the years. Increasing her workload prompted Dave to step up and manage things at home. However, after finding the kids alone at home multiple times, he voiced concerns about their youngest, age 13, being unsupervised. Lisa reacted defensively, snapping at him that if he wasn't comfortable, he could reduce his hours. The next day, she woke up to find Dave already at work. That evening, she returned home to find him there, helping the kids with homework and cooking dinner. With a slight tremor in her voice, she thanked him for supporting her career. As her weekend work began, Dave once again stepped up, taking on the main responsibility of entertaining the kids rather than seeing it as a burden. He appeared to relish it and find renewed purpose in life. The kids enjoyed reconnecting with their dad and everyone had a great time. Even their 17-year-old son sacrificed some of his time with friends to join his dad and siblings on outings until three months ago. Lisa's association with John had remained strictly platonic. However, one Saturday, following a pleasant lunch and a flurry of compliments, John proposed booking a hotel room for the afternoon, initially dismissing it as a jest. Lisa's amusement faded when she realized John wasn't joking. It deeply unsettled her. Hastily, she concocted excuses and laughed it off. But inwardly, 
She cursed John for jeopardizing their friendship with a sexual advance. She knew she would never betray her husband. The following Monday at work was disheartening for Lisa, as John treated her with distant professionalism. By week's end, she found herself longing for his presence. The absence of meaningful interactions, lunches, and compliments. Despite her efforts to linger after work, each day weighed heavily on Lisa. She acknowledged that the acknowledgement of her professional and feminine strengths had become crucial over self-esteem. Though Dave was attentive and complimentary, it lacked the same significance. Two incidents that week should have signaled obsession to Lisa. Firstly, on Wednesday, she returned home to find dinner, only partially prepared with Dave asking her to finish it while he fetched their eldest from soccer practice. Upon his return, Lisa remained seated where she was causing dinner to be delayed. This led to their first confrontation. Dave questioned the worth of her work-focused dedication, prompting Lisa to lash out. Venting her pent-up frustrations from feeling overlooked by John onto Dave, she had calmed down by bedtime, denying any issues, when Dave inquired if they were all right. However, Dave noticed her distracted demeanor and refrained from pursuing intimacy, feeling increasingly rejected by her consistent rebuffs. On Friday afternoon, John approached Lisa and offered an apology. He attributed his behavior to being in close proximity to such an attractive and desirable woman while feeling lonely. Lisa accepted his apology, but made it clear she was committed to her marriage and intended to remain faithful to her husband. In response, John inquired if any of her colleagues would be open to helping him alleviate his frustration. This remark triggered a possessive reaction from Lisa, who promptly rejected the idea. Despite this exchange, they parted on amicable terms with Lisa, agreeing to meet him for lunch and a show. The following day, the second trigger of obsession occurred when Lisa returned home on Friday evening to find Dave and the kids packing for a camping trip. When she questioned them about it, they explained that they had planned this long weekend getaway a month ago. They looked at her incredulously when she claimed to have no prior knowledge of it. They reminded her that they had discussed it over dinner all week, but she refused to believe them. Lisa insisted on rescheduling for the following weekend, but they refused, citing that this was the last opportunity before winter set in. Consequently, the family left for their trip without her leaving Lisa feeling upset at home alone. Her only consolation was that their absence provided her with three days to reconcile with John. It hit Lisa hard the next day after the show when John announced he was unavailable for Sunday and Monday. Despite trying to reach her family, they were out of reach in an area with no cell service. Lisa remained upset upon their return. She refrained from blaming them for not informing her of their whereabouts, fearing she might have ignored their communication that night. She declined intimacy with John, citing the need to be fresh for work. Alarm bells rang in her mind when Dave suggested her ambitions were driving a wedge between her and her family. After giving him a piece of her mind, she refocused on planning her week with John. She jolted awake before 3 a.m., realizing the harm that her actions and conversations were causing to her perfect marriage and family. The thought of Dave leaving and leaving her to raise the children alone sent a shiver down her spine. However, the idea of losing her loving and considerate husband was even more distressing. Determined to cool her extramarital friendship, she snuggled closer to Dave, finding comfort in his embrace. Though tempted to initiate intimacy as they used to, she refrained, mindful of his early wake-up time. Subconsciously sensing her need for closeness, Dave greeted her with a warm hug when she returned home later that night. Yet under John's influence, Lisa couldn't fully reciprocate the affection. This set the stage for the following month. Within a week, things returned to normal with John, as did her marriage and family. However, it was a new kind of normal. While the four of them laughed, joked, and interacted, Lisa felt detached, unaware of the concerned looks. Dave shot her way countless times each night. Eventually, Dave reached his breaking point and pleaded with her to abandon the promotion. He expressed his love for her and confessed his fear about the impact of her increased workload on their family. Unfortunately, he couldn't have chosen a worse day to pour out his feelings on that very day. John had subtly but firmly stated his desire to maintain their friendship, only if she agreed to take it to the next level. Lisa was deeply preoccupied. 
The thought of losing the ego, boosting compliments from John made her uneasy, as Dave begged and implored. Lisa wrestled with her decision. It was obvious that if she had to choose between John and her husband, Dave would prevail. However, she was desperate to avoid making that choice. She relied on both of them, one for stability and the other for validation of her ego. Even after her husband fell silent, Lisa utilized her considerable intellect to devise a solution without risks. By 2 a.m., she had a plan. The very next night, she explained it to John, emphasizing her steadfast commitment to her husband and her unwillingness to cheat. She outlined her scheme, enticing Dave into a three-way where John would conveniently become the third participant since the men had never met. It would appear as if John were chosen randomly. If successful, she would then figure out a way to spend time alone with John, later with Dave's approval, thus avoiding infidelity. However, she cautioned John that convincing Dave would take time and requested his patience. John hesitated, briefly weighing the months he had already invested in pursuing Lisa, confident that once her self-imposed barrier was breached, she would be his whenever he desired. He agreed, warning her that he wouldn't wait indefinitely. Lisa was grateful for his consent, even allowing him to kiss her properly for the first time. However, she drew the line when he attempted to touch her breast. Angered by her own arousal, she firmly pushed his hand away, reiterating her commitment to fidelity, and they proceeded to dinner. Lisa didn't feel particularly anxious about discussing a certain topic with Dave. Their relationship had always been one of openness and truth, especially about their desires, and they had explored role-playing together numerous times over the years. However, feeling too exhausted to broach the subject that night, Lisa chose to meet after Dave had fallen asleep the next night. The timing still didn't seem right, so she again waited until Dave was asleep before she began to pleasure herself, lost in her fantasies about John. She couldn't suppress a soft moan, her arousal intensifying. Suddenly, her private moment was interrupted by Dave shifting towards her. This seems a bit unfair, doesn't it? Dave remarked. Why? What's unfair about it? Lisa asked, puzzled. You lying there? Pleasuring yourself after you've been rejecting me for the past few months? Dave pointed out. Lisa was shocked. She hadn't realized it had been that long. Has it really been that long, sweetheart? She asked, disbelief in her voice. Absolutely. Ever since you started chasing that promotion, you've either been too exhausted to irritable or simply brushed me off whenever I tried to initiate something. Dave explained, feeling a twinge of guilt. Lisa saw this as an opportunity to finally talk about the issue that had been on her mind. She took a moment to justify to herself how her infatuation with John was affecting their marriage. Ready to open up, she looked for the right way to start this delicate conversation. However, so wrapped up in her thoughts, she didn't notice when Dave sighed and turned away again. She realized that suggesting a three-way after a four-month dry spell might bruise Dave's ego, implying that he alone no longer satisfied her. No, the safer approach was to reconnect with Dave first. Rolling towards him, she pulled him close, but he started snoring once on his back. Lisa felt too embarrassed to even continue. She needed to release her pent-up desires before Lisa fretted. Before John entered her life, there was nothing wrong with her marriage or sex life. After two days of inaction, John seemed a bit miffed with Lisa. The following day, she had to kiss him again to prevent him from criticizing her. This time, he behaved and refrained from making any advances. However, it left her feeling aroused enough to passionately kiss Dave when she returned home and even caressed his groin while doing so. Dave's eyes lit up, and they didn't wait for the kids to go to bed. As soon as dinner ended, they retreated to the small outdoor shed where Dave had installed their jacuzzi his solution to maintaining a healthy bed life as their children grew older. Once inside, Dave eagerly initiated intimacy when Lisa jokingly remarked on his impatience. Dave defended himself, explaining that he didn't want to give her a chance to change her mind. Dave performed as usual, but Lisa only reached climax when she closed her eyes and recalled the sensation of John's bulge pressing against her leg. Earlier that afternoon, the next morning, Saturday, Dave woke her up in the way she used to enjoy his tongue, exploring her intimately. While Dave likely assumed she used the pillow to stifle her moans in reality, even with her eyes shut, Lisa struggled to pretend Dave was John.
it was a pleasurable yet perplexing experience for her. That evening, she felt confident enough to bring up the sensitive topic with her husband. After praising his recent performance, she cautiously broached the subject. Despite their many years together, she admitted that things had started to feel a bit routine, and she had developed a fascination with the idea of a three-way. With Dave's open-mindedness, he immediately proposed they role-play it. This response exceeded Lisa's expectations, so they returned to the jacuzzi. After each encounter, they collapsed on the provided mattress, thoroughly exhausted. In fact, the revived intimacy with Dave nearly persuaded Lisa to abandon her plan about a week and a half into what she considered Dave's adjustment period. John grew increasingly impatient, and the compliments began to dwindle. Lisa found herself needing to kiss him almost daily just to maintain his interest. Eventually, even that wasn't sufficient, and she sensed John withdrawing once again. Two days after a lengthy session in their jacuzzi shed, Lisa felt ready to broach a sensitive topic with Dave. She had been building up the courage to discuss their sexual adventures and what she envisioned for their future. However, before she could bring it up, Dave initiated the conversation. Sweetheart, the past few weeks have been amazing. I found it incredibly arousing to have our guests join us in our intimacy. Have you thought about reciprocating by being intimate with her as well? How do you see this fitting into our role play? Dave inquired, full of anticipation. Lisa was shocked, realizing there had been a significant misunderstanding between them. What do you think? I want a three-way with another woman. She responded, confused and surprised. Dave, sounding confused himself, asked, Isn't that what this has been leading up to? Lisa understood then that they hadn't clearly communicated their desires leading to this confusion. No, Dave. My thoughts were on including another man. Lisa clarified, realizing the moment was ripe for an honest conversation. Dave reacted, prompting Lisa to seize the opportunity and express her desires more explicitly. Listen, honey, I've been really excited these past few weeks. Is there any chance we could make my fantasy a reality with another man? I mean, Lisa proposed, hopeful yet nervous. Dave pondered her suggestion carefully. Well, Lisa, honestly, I don't see that ending well for us. I thought we both liked the idea of including another woman. The thought of another man doesn't sit well with me. He admitted his discomfort evident. What if it's something I feel strongly about, Dave? Lisa pressed, seeking his openness to her perspective. Dave considered her words. I'd need time to think about it. The only way I might consider it is if we could also include another woman at a different time. He suggested trying to find a middle ground. No, you wouldn't have to interact with her. That could be just for me. Lisa offered, attempting to negotiate. I said no. Lisa, the idea of you with another woman upsets me. Let's drop this idea. It's off the table, Dave asserted firmly. Then that answers my question. We can't include another guy either, Lisa realized, recognizing the impasse in their conversation. The finality in Dave's tone signaled the end of her hopes for this particular fantasy. The next day, when Lisa spoke to John about the conversation, he was clearly upset accusing her of not trying hard enough and then giving her the cold shoulder for the remainder of the week. Frustrated and disappointed, Lisa was left to deal with the fallout of their failed negotiation and the tension it created. On Monday, John requested a private conversation with Lisa after everyone else had left. He appeared genuinely saddened as he expressed his inability to continue being around such a beautiful woman who wasn't available to him sexually. Lisa found herself forced to choose between him and her husband, and she chose her husband despite the pain it caused John. He respected her decision, bid her goodbye with a kiss, and asked her to remember him fondly. He understood that their relationship had to revert to a professional one and began to walk away. Wait. John halted and turned back. Give me another week, please. What do you have in mind? inquired Lisa. I'm not sure. Lisa just grabbed me a week to come up with something, with another kiss. They parted ways. Observing Lisa's return to her distracted state over the weekend, Dave contemplated her recent mood swings and her newfound fixation on three ways. Now he had another concern. Why was her lipstick smudged when she returned home late on Friday? It was time to do some investigation. Having had ample time over the weekend to mull things over, Lisa eagerly approached John after work on Monday. His eyes brightened as she explained her plan. However, midway through, he interjected, John raised a cautious note as they discussed their plans. 
You know, Lisa, he might expect something in return for this. Lisa, mindful of her boundaries, replied confidently. There are certain concessions I'm willing to make, but I also have clear lines that I won't cross. We'll just have to see how things unfold. John. Wanting to ensure clarity and commitment warned, just remember, dear, if he ultimately doesn't agree, then I'm pulling out of our plans altogether. I understand, John, if that's the outcome, I'm prepared to accept it. Lisa acknowledged John expressed his understanding, offering himself as a practice subject if needed. With his implied approval, Lisa spent the majority of Tuesday and Wednesday at work devising her strategy. She began with the fundamental premise that whatever action she took must pose no risk to her marriage and family. She likened it to a game of poker where she had won a $1,000 pot and was unwilling to risk it. She desired to secure it in a time-delayed safe, ensuring its safety even from herself. This way she could continue playing, knowing she might win another $1,000. But even if she lost, she still retained the... On Wednesday evening, John treated her to dinner for a complete rehearsal following the main course. He instructed her to give it her best shot. Well, John, I've decided to come at him strong and swiftly tomorrow night. I'll begin by expressing my deep love for him, emphasizing how much I cherish our children. You know, mentioning their future milestones like graduations, weddings, and grandchildren's christenings. Then I'll bring up our retirement plans that we've discussed at this point. John's mind began to wander. He noted how often women plunged right into emotional speech, a method that might influence another woman but often missed the target with males who tended to lean towards rationality over emotion. Are you paying attention, John? Lisa's words burst through his thoughts. Of course, Lisa, John replied, redirecting his attention following that. Lisa said, I'll tell him that I offered him an opportunity to join in on harmless fun, which he declined. I'll notify him that he's left me with no alternative but to seek affection elsewhere, starting with a rendezvous on Friday night before he can completely absorb this. I'll underline that it's completely physical, only a bit of emotional satisfaction. I apologize, John. I might need to fudge the truth a bit there. If he genuinely loves me, he'll allow it. I guess I have approximately a 7,030 chance of his agreeing right then and there. What do you think of the plan thus far? John privately judged the odds to be far lower than that, but kept it to himself. He felt his odds of seducing this older woman were less than 50%, but the excitement of the quest was worth it. He thought he could enjoy it once without risk. However, engaging in multiple encounters would significantly raise his chances of getting caught and losing his job for having a sexual relationship with a subordinate. Why take the risk more than once? He'd been in similar circumstances previously and understood he'd already had 90% of the fun by improving Lisa's odds of success. He might receive the remaining 10%. John was aware that spending more time with Lisa could cause problems at work, especially because bosses were not permitted to have love relationships with those they manage. He'd been in similar situations previously and knew he'd already gotten the most out of life by assisting Lisa in her success. He felt he might appreciate it a little more. John said that if he were Lisa's husband, he would have advised an open relationship. But Lisa was adamantly opposed to the idea of sharing her husband with anyone. She stated that if her husband recommended such a thing, she would prefer to dissolve their marriage than accept it. John then suggested that Lisa find a means to prevent her spouse from making any movements she disliked. He was talking about her threatening to divorce him and how he might not get to see their children much if they split up. But Lisa disliked the concept of deploying such threats, even as a bluff. John attempted to get Lisa to speak up for herself, claiming that the problem they were in was her husband's fault for not agreeing to her proposals in the first place. He clasped her hands, looked into her eyes, and told her she deserved to discover her own happiness. After years of putting her family first, Lisa began to consider John's point of view. However, she made it plain that everything was dependent on her husband, Dave, agreeing to their plan. If she felt Dave wasn't on board, she would back out. John reassured Lisa that they could not lose. Although Peter questioned the veracity of Lisa's hopes while they waited for dinner, Lisa used the opportunity to jot down some ideas for her plan. After they finished their meal, John walked her to her car and kissed her goodnight. 
This moment marked the end of their conversation about how to navigate their tricky position, concentrating on personal needs and the limits they were willing or unwilling to breach. On this occasion, John softly held her, and she exhibited no resistance. Instead, she made a subtle move closer to him. She could feel his reaction through his garments, which almost overpowered her. John briefly pondered taking things further. However, he concluded that it was preferable to keep the fun environment between them. Okay, love, I'll book a room for us on Friday night. Can we go to your place? I've never seen it before, John replied, his voice full of interest and enthusiasm. No way, she said, laughing. Her comment had a lighthearted tone. The walls are far too thin and you'll be yelling way too loudly. I can assure you of this. Lisa returned home to her family with shaking legs. She was significantly more distracted than usual. She discovered she was alone after everyone else had gone to bed. As a result, she slept in the next day, waking up just in time to see the kids leave. She reminded them that she had arranged for Dave's parents to bring them up for a sleepover that night and ensured they had everything they needed. She had scheduled the day off. She had to phone John at least five times to keep her courage during the day. She was well aware of her greatest weakness, her inability to lie convincingly. When Dave was handed her ultimatum, the obvious question he would ask was whether she already had someone in mind, in front of the mirror. She practices saying no. She intended to go out and let herself be seduced. Anything else would raise questions she was uncomfortable with. She told herself that by staying cool, calm, and collected, she would be able to pull it off. So there she was, seated at the kitchen table, ready to ambush her husband, who was due any minute. It was Thursday night, 24 hours until a highly anticipated event. The children were staying overnight with their grandparents. Lisa was completely ready. She just kept telling myself, Chicana Bee Company can't lose, I deserve it. Dave entered the house at 5.30 p.m., an hour and a half later than his new regular time of 4 p.m., he had most likely timed his appearance knowing Lisa had the day off. When he entered, he spotted Lisa sitting at the kitchen table with a three-quarters empty bottle of wine in front of her, knowing that she rarely drank more than one glass. Dave immediately recognizes the enormity of the issue. He saw that this was more than simply a great occasion. It was also an opportunity for Lisa to be more open and vulnerable. Hello, Elise. What do we celebrate? Did you receive the promotion? Dave inquired, his tone tinged with both curiosity and anxiety. We're not celebrating, dear, at least not yet. Please sit down. We need to chat, Dave. Lisa reacted with a serious tone that invited a deeper conversation. Lisa was surprised by her own nerves. Despite her Dutch courage, she had imbibed. She found herself feeling more anxious than she had imagined. She silently repeated her mantra. Stay firm, Lisa. You cannot lose. You deserve it. Dave was the first to initiate the conversation. I believe this has something to do with your recent diversion. Perhaps it is due to the fact that you have been primarily absent from family life for the past six months. Perhaps it's the five-month dry spell we've had in the bedroom, with the exception of those two lovely weeks. Dave, I understand. Let me guess. Lisa, you still love me profoundly. You envisage a future together, attending our children's milestones and eventually retiring in style. Despite this, because I did not consent to your clandestine three-way scheme, you now intend to cheat on me with your lover. Am I correct? Is it happening tonight or tomorrow evening? Dave paused. Lisa's thoughts was filled with alarm bells. He had just recounted the first page and a half of her notes with remarkable precision. In a crisis, Dave's clarity of thought outperformed her own. He had demonstrated this truth twice previously— saving their children's lives while she froze. She was completely shaken. In a panic, she reverted to her practiced speech. But I deserve it, Dave. I, I, it would just be physical. Dave, just a little fun to keep things interesting for us emotionally in a condition of terror. Lisa went on with her speech, reading a piece that John had recommended the night before, though she hadn't memorized it as thoroughly as the rest. She cautioned Dave not to sleep with other women, threatening divorce, loss of access to their children, and financial ramifications. Lisa noted a change in Dave's look mid-sentence, which was fierce and stormy rather than guilty or resigned. 
Lisa, perplexed by Dave's abrupt transformation, was presented with name-related queries. Dave's intent on knowing the identify of the person involved demonstrated the gravity of the circumstances. Lisa, caught off guard and unprepared for this line of questioning, hesitated before providing John's name, stating that he would never indulge in such activity. Dave's inquiry became more intense, accusing Lisa of seeing John behind his back and citing her recent actions as evidence of adultery. Despite Lisa's assertions of innocence, Dave is doubtful, wondering if John influenced her actions and humiliated him personally. Lisa found herself in a tough situation, feeling both insulted and afraid because the conversation with Dave had taken an unexpected turn. She was unsure how to demonstrate her devotion to him. She attempted to explain that her late nights and weekends out were innocent, consisting solely of discussions and meals with John. But Dave didn't believe her, citing a specific incident in which Lisa returned home disheveled, implying that her appearance was suggestive of a sexual encounter in a moment of desperation. Lisa increased her voice in an attempt to persuade Dave of her innocence, emphasizing that there was no infidelity on her part, only talking during dinners and some kissing. She pleaded with him to believe that she would never abandon their marriage. Dave, overwhelmed by the circumstances, buried his face with his hands, a sign of sorrow. Lisa, who had never seen Dave cry before, kept a tight eye on him, knowing the symptoms of someone attempting to hide their inner distress. She was horrified to realize that she may have caused such deep hurt in Dave. The prospect of losing everything due to a misunderstanding struck her with fear and disbelief. Lisa recalled the final section of her prepared defense in a last-ditch effort to save the situation, often regarded as her ultimate escape strategy. She was ready to renounce all of her intentions with John and completely withdraw from the events that had led to this catastrophe, believing that such a compromise would restore the damage. However, before she could provide the remedy, Dave concluded that Lisa's actions had irreversibly harmed his marriage and family, expressing deep betrayal and anguish. He even claimed she threatened to separate him from their children. As Dave went out the door, his remarks carried a sense of finality that worried Lisa even more. She was temporarily paralyzed by the intensity of the situation. Dave was halfway to his car when she found the bravery to pursue him. She hadn't got the chance to present her last-ditch solution near his automobile. She sought to assert her innocence once more. Dave halted but did not turn to face her. His response emphasized his perception of her behavior as unacceptable. He saw her spending time away from the family, lying about her motives, going to dinner with John, and kissing him as examples of cheating. Dave announced the end of their relationship in a resigned tone, leaving Lisa to face the truth of her decisions and their influence on her marriage. Lisa collapsed to her knees, too surprised and overwhelmed to support herself. She watched her husband drive away in disbelief, dropped a tear, and couldn't lose. She quickly remembered her preparations for their showdown. The thought of contemplating the end of their marriage had just crossed her mind when she made her empty threat. She never believed Dave would consider terminating it as well, for just over an hour. Lisa allowed herself to wallow in self-pity. The thought of having irreversibly wrecked a good relationship was too scary to consider, so she shoved it to the back of her mind. Another concern persisted deeply. Dave's leaving remarks and behavior had set up alarm bells in her thoughts. For the first time, she was concerned about how her ultimatum had affected her husband, who was deeply committed to her and their family. She feared he might hurt himself. She had made it plain that if they divorced, he would most likely lose custody of their children and a large chunk of his money. They were aware of examples where ex-wives were denied access to their children, helped by biased legal systems. Would he consider injuring himself? Damn, yes, panic set in. Dave didn't answer his cell phone. Lisa called her in-laws to see if Dave was still with them, but he had left. They were perplexed. David stayed shortly before leaving, hugging their three children. Lisa hastily drove to every establishment she could think of while looking for his automobile. She was so preoccupied that she ran out of gas and had to contact her father for assistance. Recognizing her concern, he drove her home. She broke down and told her parents that Dave had left her. She saw the pain in her mother's eyes. Her father's statements made his feelings toward his son-in-law plain. Her mother eventually yielded, agreeing that it was best for Lisa to come home and dropping her off at the car. 
Lisa returned home and fell asleep on the couch in the early morning. Nightmares woke her up at 7 a.m. Before she could shake off the grogginess, panic overtook her. She anxiously searched her phone for none. She phoned Dave's cell, but it went directly to voicemail, as if it were turned off or had run out of battery. His charger rested next to hers on the kitchen counter. She referred to his workplace learning. He had not shown up to call the police. She explained why her spouse had departed, but they provided little support. It was 8 a.m. So she contacted every friend in Dave's address book, but none had seen him. She spent the entire day driving to every possible destination, returning home every several hours to check on Dave's car, which never showed up, and his phone remained unavailable. When she received a message from John Hyatt, reality returned for a brief moment. Room 700, 706 p.m. The message sent shivers down her spine, but she controlled her reaction. Dave is the next person to be called, still unsure of his location and concerned for the children. Lisa asked them to care for the children temporarily at home. Lisa crumpled the couch, overcome with grief. She must have fallen asleep again, waking up abruptly at 3.30 a.m. She sought to conjure Dave's image but was unable, feeling an unreasonable belief that he had died. She dreaded losing her sanity, but she pushed the thought away with dread. When she returned to her car, she discovered her cell phone on the passenger seat had been neglected. Her eldest messaged her once, but John sent her six. She listened to her child's message, which expressed longing for her mother, but ignored the others until around 10 a.m. She searched for Dave's automobile in prospective suicide spots such as bridges, ravines, and lonely regions, but found nothing. Lisa, desperate, contacted Dave's parents again, but there were still no updates. She contacted all of his buddies once more. This time, when she called Dave's oldest buddy, who also happened to be his former boss, she thought he wasn't totally forthcoming. Suspecting something was wrong, she looked up his address and decided to drive by to look for Dave's car, located in a wealthy neighborhood. She discovered the house but saw no trace of Dave as she drove away. Her gaze was drawn to a uniquely marked Lexus parked three homes down. It belongs to John. The automobile was stationed outside another opulent home, among many others. Suddenly, the idea of getting comfort from a man who, above all, was her friend, appealed to her. She parked her car and approached the front door. She could hear muffled revelry coming from inside, signaling a Saturday afternoon gathering. Next to the door was a wall-integrated panel with a security keypad, doorbell, and intercom button. She pushed the button. When Lisa arrived at her workplace, she was greeted by Mr. Goldsmith, the general manager. She asked to see John Stanhope. Mr. Goldsmith recognized her when he saw his car outside and asked her in. Lisa, concerned of her unkempt appearance, chose to wait outside. Mr. Goldsmith promised to bring John for her. Shortly after, John arrived to meet Lisa. He swiftly made sure they were alone before embracing her, kissing her, and holding her close to the wall. Lisa, overcome with emotion, sought consolation in John's arms, moving from a kiss to a close hold. John was eager to learn what had happened the night before, causing Lisa to recount her frightening encounter with Dave, who had accused her of infidelity and appeared to be aware of her plans, raising concerns that Dave may have done something severe as a result of his departure. Following that discussion, their intimate time was unexpectedly broken by an angry woman storming out, accusing John of betrayal and mourning their decision to flee similar troubles, implying a history of problems. Lisa, acting on impulse, moved in to avoid any potential injury, placing herself between John and the enraged woman. The irate woman, seeing Lisa as an easy target, spun around and delivered a strong backhand, sending Lisa falling against the wall, mistakenly hitting the intercom button and crying out in pain. Lisa sank to the ground, stunned, as the irate woman proceeded to pummel John. The situation worsened until the company's manager stepped in, softly but firmly restraining John's wife and chastising her for turning to violence. After briefly discussing the problem, the employer asked John and Lisa to meet with him in his office on Monday at 9 o'clock. He led John's wife back inside, leaving him filled with emotion. He hurried to his car and sped away, leaving Lisa reeling from the incident, overwhelmed and distraught. Lisa ultimately managed to gather herself and returned home. 
She contacted her mother, who urged her father to pick her up and drive her to their family home. Lisa cried all night and slept for the majority of the following day before crying again. Lisa's company's general manager met with the manager on Monday to discuss the problem. They couldn't take action until they heard Lisa's version of the tale, and they agreed not to terminate John until his wife made her decision. The boss was aware that John's wife had left with the children to see her mother. They agreed to allow Lisa till the end of the day tomorrow to contact them before declaring her in breach of her contract. The manager asked if they believed John's allegation that he and Lisa had not had sex. The boss remarked that it was still deemed cheating, whatever. They lamented the intricacies of human relationships and the HR. The manager is frustrated by people's inability to be content with what they have. Lisa felt well enough on Monday evening to phone her in-laws to check on the kids. She thought she could handle seeing the kids now, but she dreaded seeing Dave's parents. Fearful that their kid might die as a result of her actions, she devised a strategy to persuade them to leave the children at home without her. Lisa's emotions were difficult to express, using the word shocked. When Dave's mother informed her that all three children refused to meet her and threatened to call the police if she arrived before Lisa could react, the call ended suddenly. Lisa awoke dazed, lying on the kitchen floor, stiff and sore. The realization that she had wet herself surprised her even more. After a long shower, she spotted the lowering sun and realized she had made the call shortly after dusk. She looked at her phone and noticed it was 6 p.m. Tuesday. She'd been out of it for about 24 hours. What exactly had happened? Despite feeling better than she had in days, Lisa was eager to regain control of her life. Though the notion of Dave's death tried to overwhelm her, she pushed it away and drew strength from her children. She decided to surprise her in-laws and bring the children home. When she arrived at Dave's parents' house, she was surprised to see her own parents' automobile sitting there. They came from the entrance and quickly led her back to her car. Lisa protested, requesting to see her children. Her father informed her that they were not there and told her to follow them home, which she unwillingly did. When Lisa arrived home, she discovered her mother pouring tea in the kitchen and immediately questioned about her children's whereabouts. Her father reassured her that Dave had the kids and was still alive, implying that they had recently spoken with him. Lisa then inquired about Dave's whereabouts, causing her parents to exchange uneasy stares. Before confessing that he had taken the kids to meet certain people, Lisa's mother interrupted impatiently, expressing disgust and guilt in Lisa's behavior and supporting Dave's version of events over Lisa's account. Lisa felt guilty and kept silent as her mother began to discuss Dave's interaction with an old friend named Deborah Harris, which caused Lisa tremendous concern. Lisa knew Dave and Deborah had separated when she attended a business college distant from their hometown, and Deborah's recent divorce reinforced Lisa's suspicions. Her parents said that when Deborah saw Dave state, she took him home, where he has been since. Lisa's parents also informed her that Dave had taken the kids to meet Deborah and her children to see how they got along. They informed Lisa that nothing had happened between Dave and Deborah before to this, but they appeared to be getting along well now. Lisa was upset and insisted that Dave give her a chance. However, her parents described Dave's point of view, indicating that he was devastated by Lisa's claims about working late while fooling on another man. Lisa's father underlined that cheating involved more than simply physical contact. It also entailed lying and having private talks with another man. Lisa protested, claiming she didn't mean to threaten Dave, but her father expressed disbelief and disappointment in her actions, emphasizing the emotional toll they had taken on Dave and the family. Lisa returned to stillness, her gaze falling to the table as she noticed both of her parents shaking their heads with frigid displeasure. She realized what Dave must have felt, the web of lies, deception, contempt, and emotional gap that had built between them over the previous six months became starkly visible. She realized her marriage was beyond repair. Her parents gave her some time to ponder everything before her mother spoke up. How will the kids and I survive without Dave? Lisa queried, her tone tinted with dread. Her parents exchanged a gloomy look, causing her father to nod to her mother, who took a deep breath before relaying Dave's message. Lisa Dave has been debating the notion for the past five days, thinking whether the children would be better off with you or him. However, due to the threats you've made against him, 
He believes he can't leave them with you. Her mother looked at her father again, seeking his support, which he gave by gently squeezing her hand. We must be honest with you, Lisa. We share his worries, her father added. From our standpoint, if we support you, we may lose access to our only grandkids. Lisa was taken aback, requiring a time to process the weight of their comments. As frustration grew within her, she couldn't help but express her disappointment. So you are side with him? She accused with a sense of betrayal. Her father's response was quick. You started this, Lisa. Lisa remained unfazed. I will fight all of you. When it comes to custody issues, the courts usually favor the mother. He cannot prove I cheated because I did not. Lisa, this is not about proving anything. Her mother intervened. Dave simply wants out of his marriage. The youngsters are old enough for their preferences to be considered in court. And let me tell you, if the court had questioned them tonight, you would not have a chance. And if I win, you will most likely lose custody rights permanently. The seriousness of her mother's comments struck Lisa, leaving her reeling from the stark truth of her circumstances. With her final bridge burned, Lisa dashed to her car and they both yelled at epilogue. Two weeks later, the court granted an interim order. It favored Dave because of his steady employment, close relationship with the children, six-month role as primary caretaker, and stable living arrangement. Furthermore, the children's choices were weighed, which strengthened his proposed visitation privileges. Lisa was on the opposing side, financially insecure with no work or references, and unable to fund the home's purchase. The court made his ruling with confidence because the statutory 12-month separation time had passed and the divorce was finalized. Lisa has regained much of her previous self. Her parents forgiven her, and she committed to being a caring mother, particularly during fortnight sessions. She even consented to go to a wake with Dave and his new fiancé. However, after getting the final divorce papers, she received a scathing email from John who blamed her for his divorce and job loss. She blamed the demise of her marriage on her own avarice. She realized she was dissatisfied with what she had and wanted more. The only residual difficulty upsetting her otherwise resigned contentment were the reoccurring nightmares, which eventually decreased from nightly to once or twice per week. In one particularly unsettling dream, a choir sang, Shocking be firm, can't lose. I deserve it. However, she now finds solace in being able to go asleep quite easily by reminding herself that completing one out of four goals wasn't so bad after all. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed the story, please consider liking and subscribing if you have not already. If you have a story to tell me about your own or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.